He is the ambassador at large. Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy, U.S. Department of State. I want to call to the stage Nathaniel C. Fee. Nathaniel, the stage is yours. Good morning. My name is Nate Fick. I'm the United States Ambassador at Large for Cyberspace and Digital Policy, which means I oversee our diplomatic engagements on technology topics, helping to ensure that our cyber and digital and emerging tech tools are in support of broader foreign policy objectives. My background is as a cybersecurity entrepreneur and investor with many colleagues here in Israel and as a combat Marine. At the risk of being overly ambitious in my 10 allotted minutes, I'd like to cover three things here this morning. First, why technology innovation matters to foreign policy and how to think about sustaining it as a competitive advantage. Second, what it means to be a responsible actor in cyberspace and how we, the US, Israel, and our like-minded allies and partners might continue setting a positive example. And third, a couple areas where it feels like there's more we can all do together. So first, on innovation. Technology innovation as a source of national or coalition power is increasingly foundational, more like demography or geography or natural resources than like GDP or military capability. In the decades ahead, nearly every traditional measure of influence will be downstream from a nation's ability or a coalition's ability to sustain advantages in areas of tech innovation. Moreover, in any contest among states or between systems of governance more broadly, many other issues held dear by so many of us in this room, from free markets to the rule of law to equal treatment for all people, find purchase only if rights-respecting countries prevail in shaping the future of these foundational technologies. Israel and the US have exemplified this. Investments our countries have made in building ecosystems around technical parts of our governments and the people who gain their formative experiences there, partnered with universities and investment capital, large companies and small, have contributed greatly to the vibrant economies and societies that we both have today. Supporting rights respecting technology development, deployment and use requires that we do at least four things. First, as my colleague Director Walden made very clear up here, we must articulate an affirmative and inclusive vision of the enormous benefits of a shared technology future. A future that's based upon freedom, openness, interoperability, reliability, and security. And we need to build the broadest po possible coalition around it. This is about much more than competition or conflict with any particular regimes. The promise of strategic technology is at its heart about connecting people globally with the benefits of multiple simultaneous technology revolutions. It's about how all people learn, how we communicate, how we extend our lives and improve their quality. It's universal. Doing this in coalitions matters. Technology innovation benefits from more research and development, from larger markets, greater numbers of entrepreneurs and companies. No country or small group of countries can do it on its own. Second, we must assert leadership in the multilateral fora where tech norms and standards are established and enforced with the goal of sustaining and defending rights respecting development, deployment and use of technologies while simultaneously pushing back against the onslaught of more authoritarian approaches. Multilateral diplomacy can be messy and slow and it's tempting to withdraw in frustration. But just as nature abhors a vacuum, when the United States and our partners step back, others fill the void, pushing authoritarian agendas with relentless purpose. Third, we should defend and extend areas of tech advantage where we have them, rather than losing them and being forced to catch up again, as happened, for example, with telecommunications technology since the 1990s. This, of course, includes supporting domestic policies to encourage foundational research and entrepreneurship, tax and regulatory policies to foster business creation and growth, IP protection and the rule of law. But it also has major international elements, including cooperation to harmonize shared approaches to issues ranging from 
data flows to artificial intelligence in order to enable larger markets and greater regulatory certainty. Fourth, and this is internal to our governments uh, rather than out in the world, it's necessary to build the capacity and the literacy across our foreign policy and national security agencies to sustain a competitive technology strategy of generational duration. Our governments simply must get better at it. Allocating resources and making organizational changes are important, but the harder work is changing the culture and the incentives for practitioners to value and practice technology, foreign policy, and diplomacy. And this leads to my second point. Success in this arena demands that we, the United States, Israel, and our allies, be responsible cyber actors. Moral authority does, in fact, matter. We must reward responsible behavior and impose costs on irresponsible behavior. With power comes responsibility, and those of us with advanced capabilities must lead by example among the growing number of countries that wish to exercise these same capabilities. We can point to some successes. First, decades of diplomatic groundwork at the UN has led to the repeated affirmations by every UN member state of the framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. It's difficult to imagine any topic in today's geopolitical environment where we could garner repeated, unanimous UN member state support. The framework conveys enormous legitimacy and moral authority to our efforts to safeguard and promote an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable cyberspace, even in a world where we, as clear-eyed realists, know that our adversaries and competitors are inclined to disregard it. Now we, Israel, the US, and our like-minded partners, must work together to lead the transition from the open-ended working group that produced this framework to the program of action, the POA, that will follow it. We want the POA to be inclusive, ambitious, credible, and effective. A second success is that more than 65 partner countries, including Israel, have endorsed the Declaration for the Future of the Internet since its launch last year, articulating a shared vision for what tech policy can and should be. Third, broad and varied coalitions of countries have condemned Iran for its cyber attacks on Albania and, and have condemned Russia for its cyber attacks on Ukraine. Those coalitions continue to work together to provide assistance to remediate and secure against future attacks. The U.S. is leading by example. Our national cybersecurity strategy, for example, as you just heard, with its focus on mechanisms such as regulation, liability, and insurance, represents a large step toward the normalization of cyber risk. Instead of thinking of cyber attacks as exogenous events, the strategy seeks to roll them into existing risk management frameworks that businesses and governments understand. Likewise, there appears to be growing bipartisan support and alignment between business and government for some form of federal privacy legislation to protect all Americans from the misuse of their personal data. These steps move us closer toward closing important gaps between the United States and some of our closest allies, creating opportunities for more and deeper coordination on key technology topics. Which leads to my third and final point and a couple areas where perhaps we, the larger like-minded community of responsible cyber actors, might do more. The first is the thorny topic of commercial spyware. I know you're all aware of the recent U.S. executive order prohibiting the operational use of commercial spyware by our government if it poses significant security risks to the United States or significant risks of improper use. Abetted by a burgeoning private market in these technologies, a growing number of governments around the world use them to facilitate repression and enable human rights abuses. The EO is the first effort of its kind, and we hope it will inspire other governments to take similar measures. Building on the executive order, the U.S. and 10 partners released a joint statement on our efforts to counter the proliferation and misuse of commercial spyware, which aims to deepen international cooperation on this topic. A second area of potential further collaboration is public attribution of malicious cyber activity. We've seen many examples recently in Albania, in Costa Rica, in Ukraine, among others, of the importance of empirical, factual, and supportable attribution of attacks to their perpetrators. Attribution is essential to supporting any approach to cyberspace that is built on a rules-based order. 
Over the period of my own involvement in this field, attribution has evolved from being primarily a technical challenge to primarily a political one. Legitimacy in attribution comes not only from its technical soundness, but also from it being multilateral, with numerous responsible states lending their voices to public attributions of attacks. The US government invites more international partners to join us in addressing this urgent need on a case-by-case -case basis. In conclusion, a simple reality for us all is that the world's becoming more connected and risk federates across these connections. After over 75 years of marshalling technology as a shared source of national power, the US and Israel must continue to ensure that our shared commitments to free markets, rule of law, and democratic governance advance these vibrant economies and societies for the next 75. Tech will be at the heart of it. Thank you for having me today. It's such a pleasure and honor to be with you.